We always pick on her. All right. No hurry. That's right. No rush. No hurry. Oh, oh, oh. That, that carpet. That carpet went up. Yep. Well, it's it is good to have a full house today. I'm glad you're all here and. Like Donna said, if we get it regular and get very many more, we'll start meeting back at the chapel again. So, But I've enjoyed having it here at the house. There's Barbara. Hi, Barbara. How are you? Yes, they did. They did. They did. So, All right. We have two or three with us on Facebook, so we're going to start. So uh, I hope uh, some of you that wasn't here last week, I know not all of you could, but was able to catch up on what I did last week. Did you get two in? Did you? Good. Because we start uh, this chapter that I'm writing this book on, You Are the Light of the World, uh, we started with stand still. And that's very important to stand still. You know, uh, children get in trouble a lot because they won't stand still, <laughs> right? right? But a lot of times we get in trouble because we won't stand still. And the reason I'm saying that is because as I get through this a little bit, I want you to understand that in, in the Old Testament, when God told them to stand still, it wasn't so much that he was going to fight for them, as we've always thought. He was just going to deliver them out of their mess up that they made, you know, and help them come through. We'll see that more in a little bit. But I'm going to back up just a little bit from where I left off last week, because <clears throat> this is important to be part of what I'm doing today. Uh, we're all familiar with the story that Moses penned concerning the children of Israel in the wilderness and also what Moses penned from his perception from God. A lot of people question us, <clears throat> me and Kay and other teachers, about how we can say that not everything that Moses wrote was really true. It was a perception. Scripture, <clears throat> and I don't know what all you know, but I, I translate Scripture back from the Hebrew and the Greek. And because it was, it was translated by the King James Version, which was the Catholic Version, the Church of England, if you want to say that, also, or the Bible. And they added a lot to it. They took a lot away, and they changed the order of sentences to make it say what they wanted to say, to produce fear. And so Moses' perception came from, he grew up in Egypt <clears throat> all of his life, most of his adult life. And Abraham grew up in the Ur of Chaldees, and they worshipped all kinds of false gods. Uh, or Abraham worshipped the moon god. He worshipped uh, uh, Moloch, which was the god that they laid babies on and they burned. You know, they offered their babies year after year. And so, same for Abraham. And so, when they met and heard the voice of Jehovah, they just assumed Jehovah wanted the same thing, or, or our Father Creator wanted the same thing. And so, they're the ones that wrote a lot of stuff and said, God did this and God did that. Just like today, God sends tornadoes and God uh, punishes New Orleans and God punishes California and all the stuff that we hear from modern day Christianity and other parts of religion too. So we know that's not true. <clears throat> but the children of Israel were in the wilderness. Uh, Pharaoh continued to stoke the fires of anger that he had towards them and towards their God. And after he let them go, he decided he was going to go ahead and kill them. And the Bible says that he got all of his 600 chosen chariots and all the chariot drivers and all the captains over the chariots and everything. And uh, they began to come after Israel. And there came a time when Israel could see them coming. And it must have been a very fearful sight because they weren't a warring people. They were slaves. They'd been slaves all their life. And they had been slave minded all their life. Just like really religion causes us to be slave minded. We feel like we're a slave to a God that we have to give all our money to. We have to work real hard, right? We have to do everything to please our Father when, in fact, none of that's true. And so Israel was sore afraid, as the Bible says. The children of Israel cried out to Moses and accused him. And then Moses, you know, he wasn't moved. And he, and he said unto the people, he said, stand still. And so a lot of people will look at that and think uh, when it said the Lord uh, is going to fight for you that literally God was fighting Pharaoh and fighting the armies and fighting the people and I'll show you later on a little bit where that's not true he wasn't fighting anybody at that time and so we talked about how we found in uh, six places in scripture and uh, actually I did today where it said the Lord shall fight for you only six 
places in scripture where it said the Lord shall fight for you. And uh, six is the number for the weakness of man. Six is the number of man who has self-condemned himself. Six is the number that's given to Adam, which is Adam is, is uh, you know, we're, we're not man. We're not, I mean, we're not human, but Adam self-condemned himself and brought himself down to live in as a mere human. And then he passed that on to all people. And like we've said many times, we didn't have to accept it. You didn't have to accept that you were a sinner and you didn't have to accept that you were a sinner saved by grace. But we did because that's what everybody believed and everybody taught. And so, literally, uh, Isaiah said, See she from being man whose breath is in his nostrils. And that means see she from uh, being a, a man that only gets your information from the five sense realm, if you would, the sensory realm. And literally, I would say, quit listening to teachers that only get their knowledge from the five sense realm. Because and particularly when it comes to do with how God relates to us and how we relate to God. And so most people, all their sources come from carnal efforts. And true religion is not a fight. Would you agree with that? True religion is love. And I, I was trying to find where I, I, I did a lot of writing for John Cahill several years ago. And he's, he, he said uh, Christianity or whatever is not a fight. And he went on with a lot of other things that he said, but it's very true. But I like what Kay uh, Fairchild, Dr. Kay Fairchild, she paraphrase the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians 6, 12 to 13, this is the paraphrase of it. It says, what we might think is a battle or a fight using natural weapons is only in our natural thinking. It is giving something a power that has no real power whatsoever. Yes. Ever, where do we get that from? The Apostle Paul said no thing. Now, of course, we read it as nothing, but it says no thing presented, uh, uh, no thing formed against us shall prosper. And it talks about how we're not to fear things that come against us and stand against us because they're not real. I mean, it's hard to tell somebody that they're sick that's not real. Uh, I got very upset to a uh, with a neurologist the other day. Was my last doctor that I was told to go to, he looked at me after about 15 seconds and said, you're depressed. And I said, I'm not depressed. And he said, that's one of the signs of being depressed is denying that you're depressed. <laughs> you know? And then he, he said, but you are depressed. And he said, you're, pre you're very pre de depressed. And he said, answer these 10 questions. So I answered him and he said, you're moderately severe, depressed. Okay, well, and I said, I'm not depressed. And then he said, in that disease that the Mayo Clinic says you have, he said, there's really no proof in that. You don't have that. And you don't have this. You don't. He just goes down and he refutes everything that very qualified doctor said. And then he said, uh, so what I want you to do is I want you to take this pill. And I said, what is it? And he said, it's an antidepressant. And there's all kinds of effects it'll do. Then I want you to go to a psychiatrist and a psychologist. I walked out the door saying, no, thank you. You know, and so that's, that's man who gets his breath from the sensory realm. It's like, how can you fit everybody into one basket and say, this is everybody? And that, that kind of got me like, you, you're, you don't even know who I am. You haven't even checked me out yet. But you're just listening to the fact that there's pain in my body. So you want to say, well, it's coming from your past. So we need to deal with your past. Right. And so what does most ministry with that deals with the sensory realm do? They always want to go into your past. They want to go into what you're doing right now or what you're not doing. Right. And so it says, so here is the here's the plan. Still in Ephesians. Realize that the so-called battle is not a fight at all, but simply a realization of how things are to be seen spiritually. That's the good fight of faith. Yes. That's what Paul said. That's the fight Paul talked about. It's fighting to see how things really are spiritually. Because, and that's what we've been learning here and talking about a lot is that we need to quit seeing things the way they present themselves or people the way they present themselves and see them spiritually. See them as the breath of God. See them holy. See them righteous and see that whatever's going on in the world today it really cannot come nigh my dwelling place unless i fear it because when i fear it i give it a power right. correct it's just like the only boogeyman under the bed is the one that i believe is under the bed but it's not there but if i believe it's there then i'm going to experience fear and what does fear feel like it sends chills down your spine it makes little kids cry right it makes people scream and, and all kinds of stuff. So the truth is, there is never a need for father to fight. 
because there's no power against omnipotence. Amen. And, <laughs> and you're the one that shook your head last week, <laughs> but you're, it is true. Last week, I, I closed this out with how many believe that God fight for you, and several heads started bobbing because that's what we've been taught all of our life. Yeah. That we want God to fight for us. We want God to win our battles. We want God to, to, to make our employer treat us right and make our pastor do what he wants. Whatever it is. And I've been there before because I was taught that God fights for me. But if God is omnipotent, there's no fight whatsoever. So yes, Father delivered the children of Israel, but Father never killed anyone. Contrary to what we said. God never told them to kill anyone. See, that, that, that is another thing that uh, Moses and the other writers blamed on God. Said, God did this, God did this. No, you did it. You brought it down. Why? Because of what we taught before. We are literally masters of this earth. The word dominion, when the Bible says that God gave us dominion, it actually translates to be masters, and we are masters over this earth. And we can get whatever we speak. We can get whatever we produce. Whatever we create in our own mind, we can see it. Would you agree with me? Yes. We really can. Okay, so Father never killed anybody. And the, the thing was, there was always a way out that was provided. That's what Father does. He provides a way out. And he did it from the foundation of the world. There is a way out. Exodus is uh, the book of Exodus. Exodus means a way out. And God was giving the children of Israel a way out. He wasn't there to kill Pharaoh. He didn't, he didn't uh, force Pharaoh to go into the Red Sea, right? right? He didn't cause that to happen, and he didn't do that. They, out of their anger, they went and chased after, after him, and they caused those things to take place in their life. So Pharaoh did not have to send his armies there. And yes, Moses and others credited God for that destruction, and it was not God. And so... Uh, if we see God as a God of death and destruction, then we disdain our Father's nature completely. And see, only the kingdoms of what I called the lowlanders a few, week, a few weeks ago, they fight others. Right? They fight. And we fight. The whole world literally is living as lowlanders or living as carnal. They're not living in the cool of the day, which is the breath of God or the Spirit. That's what the King James says, the Spirit of God. And so if you don't live out of the spirit and you don't live at peace with all men, then you're going to fight. And that's what's going on in this world. There's, a, there's always been war, though. For, for as long as I can remember, there's been war. But the reason we believe our Father fights for us is there's many places in Scripture that seems to enforce the idea of a fighting God because they wrongly translated different Scriptures, different verses, and different words. I, it was really interesting. I like to do a lot of search on Google to find things. So I, this morning, uh, early this morning, I Googled the phrase, God will fight for you. Can anybody guess how many instances there are? 358 million references just on Google. And they're all teachings and they're sermons on God will fight for you. So why do you think we believe that? Because all the ministry, all the schools, all the teachings, everyone uses those scriptures that God will fight for you. And so we're always asking God to fight. I grew up under a ministry that the pastor told us to demand God to fight for us. Yeah. Demand that he fight. And he, he got up one time, and I love him, you know, I love him very much. But he took that scripture where he said, God prepares a table for us in the midst of our enemies. And he began to teach that, and we... A lot of us in the congregation was his enemies. He was mad at us. And so he used that scripture that God was going to prepare a table for him and God was going to resist us. And, God, and it's not just him. There's hundreds of ministers that's done that. Well, millions, I guess, right here. So the, we, we could say a major doctrinal belief system has come out of just six verses. Six verses. I, uh, there's 31,102 verses in the Bible. Aren't I smart? I Googled it. <laughs> 31,000, and there's six verses that s uses the phrase, fight for you. God will fight for you. And so there's been a major doctrinal thing taught out of that. And the phrase shall fight literally is to overcome. So what did God overcome for them? 
He overcame their stupid decisions. He overcame their resistance to listen to him and follow him. He overcame their, their desire to do their own thing. What did he do for the children of Israel? There was an enemy coming against him, them, and there was a, a wall that they thought was going to keep them from coming over, uh, uh, entering into the promised land, and that was the Red Sea. So according to Scripture, he, what he did is he parted the Red Sea. He made them a way out, right? And everything that he did when they were in Egypt, he made a way out. It was Pharaoh that hardened his heart. It wasn't God sending the pestilence and the, the, the fleas, and I don't think fleas were there, but sometimes it feels like fleas come against you, the frogs. and God didn't do that. Man brought that on themselves. And I've, I've clearly taught that before because the reason our planet it seems to be out of order right now is man is doing it. Man is not diminuing over the earth. Man is not giving power. Hello. Come on in. Find a chair, Donna, if you can. Hey, Sue, how are you? I guess you can squeeze in that sofa with him. <laughs> Good. Well, we do have a full house. <laughs> Donna, she's got it. She's got it. She's sitting with him. Yeah. So, so what I, I hope I can remember where I was at. Oh, I was just talking about the, the reason we have tornadoes, the reason we have storms, the reason we have everything that we have today is because man is not mastering over this earth the way they're supposed to. We curse the earth and we do not speak perfection over the earth. Scott, I was looking up one time and the word peace, and, and it literally means perfect, perfection or perfect. So when I believe when Jesus looked at the storm out on the sea, he said, you are perfect and only do what perfection will do. In other words, just water the earth. And see, what do we do? We look at storms in Oklahoma and they're coming and we start saying, oh no, we're going to have a tornado. Oh no, we're going to have hell the size of basketballs. We watch our news media that says the same thing. And, well, they're the smart ones. They must know what they're talking about. Instead of standing up and say, be perfect, not just when a storm comes, but every day. Look up at the atmosphere and say, you are perfect. You were made to water the earth. You were made to protect the earth from from, uh, I'm not a scientist, but from the things that come from outer space and look at other people and see them as perfect. He said we are to do what? Bless the earth. You know, if I, if at Barbara, if I see you somewhere and I say, Barbara, you are, I see you as perfect. Is that not going to bless you? That, that, that messenger that came to me in Rochester and he said, I see eternal perfection in you. What, he blessed me. He encouraged me. So we can encourage the earth. Correct? So could it be we have mistakenly given credit of death, destruction, fighting to our father when it was, it's man that's done that? Right? It really can't. So it really, it really is time for us to cease from feeding on this sensory knowledge. It's time, but if we don't know the truth, the truth won't make us free. And I don't know what you think free means, but free means for me to be able to live out of who I am and free to be a master of this earth. I've said this many times. I know you get bored with it, but when I was the general manager at Bob Mills, my first few months or first month or so, I was not free to be the general manager because I didn't see myself as that. I got insecure. I was worried about making rules and, and ordering furniture. And so Bob Mills had to come in and remind me of the truth that Roy... I hired you to be my general manager. I hired you to be me out there on that floor. I hired you to be me at market, and I want you to do what I told you to do. You can do it. If you want to order $50,000 worth of recliners and we need them, order them. If you want to tell a customer, you know what? I'm sorry that happened. I'll give you a free recliner. Do it. And if you make a mistake, we'll talk about it. That reminds me kind of our father. <laughs> If, we, if you make a mistake and you come to me, I will help you with it. The Bible, I've told you about the word forgive. It doesn't mean forgive as though you've, God's holding something against you. He, it, scripture says if you will uh, admit your faults to the Father, I'm paraphrasing a lot, it says he's faithful to drive that away from you. Well, what did Bob Mills do? He recognized a fault that I had. I was insecure about my position. And so he brought me in and he drove that away from me by telling me the truth and made me free to become a good manager. 
And then me and my teams that I built, we took him from doing 325,000 a month to a million a month in less than a year. Why? Because I was made free to be everything I already was. He didn't make me that way. He gave me the position, but I already had it within me to do that. Correct? This isn't my notes. That's fresh off the press. <laughs> That's right from our Father. So we need to understand that. Our Creator is nothing but love and not one of fight, not one of anger, not one of punishment, not one of eternal judgment, and not one of war. And yet, old people say, yeah, but the Scripture said, well, I'm sorry, not all Scripture was inspired by God. They put the word is there. It says all scripture inspired by God is profitable. It did not say all scripture is inspired and is profitable. And people get upset with that. And I want to say, why do you want a God like this? How's it working for you? Do you want a God that you have to fear all your life? And do you want to actually go out and tell people they don't get saved? God, the God that you love is going to burn them in hell forever? I don't. I'm not interested in that. So in the New Testament, we find in John 18, 36, Jesus is revealing the kingdom he lived out of. And this kingdom was not one of fighting one another. Pilate inferred that the Jewish leaders and the system, uh, and the system was Jesus' nation in that, in that section. So in John 18, 36, and this is the King James. Uh, if you want to look it up, go ahead. But you know me, I, I go with the flash of light. John <laughs> John 18, 36, it says, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. Amen. The, the, the Jewish kingdom that they had, that's not my kingdom. You know, because they said he says he's the king of the Jews. You know, he, he's not the king. He, he didn't say that. He's the king of everyone. He, he, as far as the king of, of teaching us and explaining things to us. So he said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would fight. Because that's what they do, yeah. right? Who was it that cut the guy's ear off? Peter? Peter. Yeah. Peter thought it was an earthly kingdom, and he thought he was going to have to fight for Jesus. Mm -hmm. And he said that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom, not from hence. In other words, my kingdom is not from man whose breath in his nostrils, but yet we've listened to man whose breath is in his nostrils tell us what the kingdom of God is and tell us what the proof of us been blessed of God. And it's having nice cars and it's having this and having that and then all the do to be stuff. You had to give and you had to serve in a church and you had to pray 24 hours a day and become spiritual giants and the list can go on and on and on. Jesus said, that's not my kingdom. And we know what the kingdom of God is. It's knowing that you're righteous and then the peace and joy that comes from that. That's what it is. And, every, and that's why we need to be ministers of righteousness. That means we don't go out and try to make people righteous. We go yes. tell them you're already righteous. Yes, amen. I can't tell you how many people I have got to share that truth with once we learned it. And I go to them and say, do you realize that when you were born from your mother's womb, you were already righteous, you were already holy, you were already pure. And the only reason you did things that the world calls bad and the church calls sins is because nobody told you who you were. They told you that you're a sinner. If you tell me I'm a dog and I believe it, then I'm going to be a dog. I'm going yeah, to bark and I'm going to pee on your carpet and, and I'm going to do all kinds of messed up stuff. <laughs> no, it's a good example because that was, that's what we were told. We were pretty much a dog. And if we would just, if we would just lick enough and, and worship enough and pray enough and God might give us favor. Right? That's scripture, darling. <laughs> Pilate then said, are you not a king then? And Jesus answered and said, you say that I'm a king. To this end I was born, and for this cause appeared in this cosmos that I should bear witness unto the truth. Anybody ever read that before? Did, it, did he say I was born to save you from hell? Did he say I was born so I can get you born again? No, he said, I came to be witness unto the truth. And that's why we say Jesus appeared on the scene as a master teacher to teach the truth of who God is, of who we have always been, the eternal love of God, and to teach the falsity and the, dam the, the damnable doctrine of religion that teaches you that you have to do to be something. 
He literally set us free. And the only reason he didn't make us free is because people didn't believe him. They didn't believe him. Because the Bible later says the truth will make you free. And make means experience. And we're always wanting Jesus to come do something for us. And we're always praying and asking God to do something for us. When God was saying to you, I've already done it. I already sent my son And I revealed the truth to you. I sent the Apostle Paul and he explained it to you. And John explained it to you. And I've sent many more comforter teachers if you would just quit being stubborn and listen. You know, there are people that don't want to listen to Apostle Paul. I cannot believe it. I understand it. And I tried to tell a person yesterday on Facebook or for two days that the Apostle Paul's words were mistranslated. They were twisted around. And that's why you don't like the Apostle Paul. But if you would read what he really said, if you would listen to the spirit of truth, and you know what? You don't have to go beat down the trail. I've done it already. I translated the book of Romans. But guess what? They don't want it. I had so many people say they want it, and there's only four that sold. Because I don't think people really want, I know there's a lot on Facebook that does, but I don't think the majority really wants the truth. They're not done wallowing in their self-pity and their self-condemnation. And they're not done yet with their belief in a God that's going to rescue them someday. All right? And we're drowning in self-condemnation. Drowning in religion. In religion. So after this, we only discover the word fight used as fight the good fight of faith. That's in the, in the New Testament. And I have fought a good fight. I'm telling you. Paul said it. I fought a good fight and I'm finishing my course. I've had the fight to stay in what I'm doing because there's been a lot of resistance, but it hasn't been a physical fight. It hasn't been speaking evil of people, but I've had the fight to stand my ground and stay where I'm at because it would have been easier for me to just keep teaching what Brother Garner taught me and not grow in it. I could, I could have gone out and preached all over the place. I had a pastor tell me if I would just quit teaching and quit translating, Roy, you can tre- preach to the crowds if you want to, and they would have helped me do it. But I said, I can't do it. And many have gone back. Many have tasted and seen the goodness of the Lord. And they've gone back to the healing ministry, to miracle ministries, to signs and wonders, to words of knowledge. Because that's what draws the crowds. It really does. But you get a salt. I promise you, I've said this before. Now, there's a group out there that will come to hear teachers today. They're all over the world. But in the mainstream church, if you advertise that we're going to have a a conference this week and we're going to have five teachers and they're going to teach you, very few people will come. But if if we say we're going to bring this prophetic person in and they're going to prophesy over you and minister to you and we're going to bring a healer here and we're going to all this stuff and one guy to teach you how to or woman to teach you how to get wealth, you can fill up auditoriums. That's really an indictment upon the church. It really is. So the last place in the epistles that this is, excuse me, I'm skipping my, uh, getting ahead. We find the word fight means struggle in afflictions, reproach, and resistance. That's the word fight that Timothy used. In the last place in the epistle of James where he deals with the brethren warring and fighting among one another because of the lust for more that wars in your members. That's the fight he was talking about. James was saying, stop fighting one another. Stop arguing with one another. And then in the book of Acts, the people were told to not fight against God, which means quarrel, dispute, or resist. Have any of you fought with God? <laughs> yeah, many times, people, many times people have gotten mad at God. You ever been mad at God? Disappointed. Huh? Disappointed because he didn't do what you thought or you know what I've paid my tithe all my life and I'm still not blessed or I did what the pastor told me to do and said God said for me to do it and it didn't happen. Right. So I think we can safely say there is no fight in our father and there should be no fighting in us whatsoever. Right. Man whose breath in his nostrils is the cause of all wars, fighting, and confusion. And again, that means man who gets their information from the sensory realm, five sense realm. So we must learn to stand still, as I said last week, and be at peace with all people, but especially with our Father. Stand still in who you are. So what does stand still mean? We need to know that. 
Well, the free dictionary defines stand still as remain in a place, hold still, and remain fixed. The Cambridge Dictionary states a condition in which all movement or activity is stopped. I like that because most of my life I've just moved around and tried to, my activity was uh, physical activity. It was trying to get something to happen, right? We, uh, the churches, they're just always doing something to please God or to get more people to come or to get more people. I've been to many board meetings trying to figure out how to get more people to, to give money, how to get people to work in the church. And that's just a lot of activity and it's fruitless activity. Yeah. Longman Dictionary says to not change. To not change. The Hebrew language for standstill is yatsab, meaning to station yourself and continue as you are. Continue as you are or continue as you eternally were. But if you don't know who you are, you can't stand still. Right? I didn't know who I was. I, I, I knew I had a title of general manager, but I, I just didn't understand. And I can see it this day. I was in the far north uh, west corner or southwest corner of Bob Mills Furniture, the older one, and I was just praying, saying, "Oh God, I'm I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I, I don't know what. I, I just didn't know what to do." I, when you when you don't know who you are, you're miserable, yes. and you don't you don't feel confident. So what happens? You make mistakes, correct? Their stress comes forth. Don and I are watching that show. What's it called again? Heartland. Huh? Heartland. Heartland, really good. If you can watch it on Netflix, we really enjoyed it. There's 12 seasons, and Don has watched about five years worth of videos in just about a few months. <laughs> she's binging, <laughs> and she's going to cry when it's over with. But this young lady is, uh, is you could call her a horse whisperer if you would. She's a great trainer, and she, she knows what's wrong with horses. And many times people bring the horse to them, and it's acting up. It won't do what it normally does. Well, it's not the horse, it's the person. And she finds out there's something going on in that person's life and the horse senses it. Right. Right? right? Well, people will sense when you don't know who you are. Right. Correct? Mm -hmm. So then we find uh, Ahmad, or Ahmad, meaning to abide, arise, confirm, dwell, raise up, and stand fast. And how many times have we read the Apostle Paul's writings about standing up, rising up, you know, all that. The scripture talks about that. So the question begs itself, what are we to stand still in? Well, how about being the master of this planet? God Almighty is omnipotent, right? Omniscient. All, what's the other one? I know him. <laughs> omnipotent. <coughs> omnipresent. But guess what? We're one with God, and so we are too. The Bible says that we have an unction of the Holy One and we know all things, right? And that means we have an unction with the Spirit of God, the breath of God, the mind of God, and we know all things. Yeah. And we think, well, I don't know everything. Yeah, you do, but you haven't tapped into what the Bible calls the mind of Christ yeah. or your spirit or the breath of God. And last week, I don't know if you saw this, heard this, Anne, last week, but there's two translations in the, in the Strong's Concordance for Ruach. One of them is actually to breathe in wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And the other one is to breathe out that wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that you learn. And that's why a week or so ago I was talking about breathing on people, but I didn't know these two translations yet. So what I do is I breathe in, and what you're doing today is you're breathing into yourself wisdom, knowledge, and understanding if you believe what I'm teaching is truth. And then you can go out into the world and breathe that out into your world. And you can be the answer to people's questions and answer to people's concerns. <coughs> so I know it's hard for people when they hear me say we are the masters over this planet. But dominion translates to be master. Yeah. And if you don't like master, then say you are, you are to take dominion. And so that's the problem is, is we're not taking dominion over the earth whatsoever. <coughs> Donna, would you come around and turn that fan off for me, hon? Do you mind? What? This fan I'm on the floor, I've got it. It's making me cough. So how about allowing that same spirit or that same breath that was in Jesus? Now, the reason I'm saying spirit or breath is because the word spirit actually means breath. The, the Catholic Church took a Latin word 
and put spirit there because it makes it very hard to obtain spirit. I've said most of my ministry, I do not know how to explain spirit to people. And I don't know for sure what spirit is myself, except for to say God is spirit. But now I understand breath. It's breath. So how about allowing that same breath that was in Jesus, remember where it said that same spirit, yeah. or let that same mind be in you, the same thing, let that same breath that was in Jesus raise us up and cause us to station ourselves, cause us to continue as we were created to be and dwell as the breath of our Father Creator. Dwell, dwell in this earth, dwell in this body. Romans 8, 11, this is my translation. It says, you also need to see that the breath of God who awakened and aroused Jesus up from death resides and is at rest in you. The same breath aroused your Messiah from the death realm also enlivened your body that was in all likelihood liable to die. Remember the word mortal means liable to die. The reason this is true is that Father himself eternally dwells in you. When you were born, the very first breath you took was breath of God. Yes. The very first breath that you let out was breath of God. Amen. We've showed you where science has proven now, and there's videos of it, that when the sperm hits the egg, there's a flash of light, a, a big flash of light. And I believe that's breath of God going into that egg. Amen. I believe that's when the impartation takes place there. Amen. So does the breath of our Creator dwell in us? Yes. 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 So therefore, if we allow... Or if we let, like Paul said, let this same mind be in you, let this breath, let, let it flow. Amen. You know, a lot of times when we go to doctors and people are sick, they're not getting enough breath. I catch myself sometimes setting, concentra concentrating on what I'm reading or doing or even watching TV. And next thing you know, I go, <gasps> I take a big breath of air and it's because my brain's saying, hey, breathe. You're not breathing, <laughs> you know. So literally, when, we, when people come and present themselves with problems to us, I think we can just about say, you're probably not breathing enough, no. and explain it to them. The breath that you're breathing in, wisdom and revelation and knowledge and understanding. I, I can lay hands on you, and I can try to minister a miracle to you. And, you know, I've laid hands on people, and they've experienced results, but it's not permanent. It's temporal. Lily, how many times have we had to have people lay hands on us in our life? Right. Probably thousands, right? right. Yeah. How many times have people given words of knowledge over us that really they were just sensing something? I mean, I can, I can spend time visiting with you guys and listen to you talk from over here, and then I can come in and give you a word of knowledge, and you're going you're gonna to go with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not saying there aren't real words of knowledge. I know there are real ones. Right. But I mean... Do you really need somebody to tell you that God loves you? A lot of people do. They do. People need to hear that you were holy before the foundation of the world. They do. But we, when you know, that's right. Once you know, then you don't need that anymore. But what I want is somebody that can come to me to tell me the truth, not something that tickles my flesh or my sensual desires like, you know, God has seen your work and, and you've been faithful and this is going to happen and this is going to happen. I don't need that. But there are people that still do. So when we stop these activities and we be still with our Father, it, capital I-T, which is the breath of God, will vitalize our liable to die mentality and our bodies that have been infected by this liable to die mentality. Most of us in here are in our 60s. We got two youngins here, and I'm sure you're not in your 60s yet. But most of us are in our 60s and 70s, and we have heard all of our life that the older you get, the harder it gets, and we get to where we expect it. I've had uh, just aches and pains, and you know, I've had people say, well, what do you expect? I've had several doctors say, well, what do you expect, Roy? You're 69. Yeah, I just want to pop them sometimes. I don't expect to hurt all my life. I don't expect to be sick. And I can't stand it when they're saying the flu's coming. It ain't coming nigh my dwelling place. I, it, will, it does not. So here's a key word. The word dwell. It said if it dwells in you. Well, dwell is important. 
the breath of God is in you, yes. right? Mm -hmm. But it needs to dwell in you. You are in my house right now, yeah. mine and Donna's house, but you don't dwell here. Mm -hmm. But Donna and I dwell here. We can go to any room, any drawer, whatever we want, but you wouldn't feel comfortable doing that because you don't dwell. No. I mean, if I found Scott walking in the <laughs> first time I met him and he's in my back there going through my drawers, I'd say, wait a minute, Scott, this is not your house. <laughs> You, you don't dwell here. What are you looking for? You know, but we treat ourselves like we're not the house of God. Oh, right? Come on. It's true. Come on. right? Yeah. We, we don't know that there's, there's wealth and there's riches inside of us that we can make withdrawals on. We still think we're just a mere slave trying to earn it from God and earning favor from God. We've got to be still. That peace is a gift. Yes, peace and perfection is a gift. To, to just to know that you know who you are and know that no weapon form against you can prosper, but, it, but you've got to know that no, nothing can come nigh my dwelling place because I am the very breath of God. The, the word dwell is O-K-O, O-I-K-E-O, and it means to occupy a house, to reside, to inhabit, and to remain. Occupy your house, inhabit your house, remain in your house, you know, remain in who you are. Mm -hmm. Jesus said in my father's house, that it said many mansions, of course. And do you know how many people believe that Jesus is really up there making mansions? Yeah. I'm not mocking them. They were been taught. But I'm telling you, there are millions upon millions think that Jesus is up there making mansions. And they still want that physical planet called heaven. It says abode, but it also says it's dwelling places. So in my father's house, there are endless dwelling abodes. If it were not true, I wouldn't have told you. In other words, we're the house of God. Yes. And there's billions upon trillions of dwelling places. Right? Yes. So in other words, father's breath dwells in every person world without beginning, without ending. Eternity. Eternity has no beginning has no ending, it's forever. Every man, woman, boy, or girl, or every animal, every creature that breathes, breathes the breath of God, yes. because that's all there is. Yes. So yes, in lowlander living, there seems to be all sorts of enemies that we want our Father to fight for us, all yes. kinds. Yes. One of them is disease. Yes. One of them is sickness. Yeah. You know, we catch ourselves and we do it. God, when are you gonna heal me? God, please heal me. Well, if you, if you could hear your father speak, he could say, you have my divine health in you, just make a withdrawal. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The Apostle Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees, was he not? Yes. He had all kinds of understanding of the Old Testament, the Torah, the law, everything. And so when he finally became a believer and accepted his mission as a comforter teacher, he still had this tendency to go back to the law. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, how many of us have had times where maybe we wanted to go back to the shouting and the hollering and the slain in the spirit and the beautiful songs and all that stuff we're used to? Well, Paul recognized that was an enemy to him to go along with what God had called him to. And so he said, Father, deliver me from this. And it was not an ophthalmology disease like some people say. It was his dependency. And what did God say? Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. And the word grace always infers spirit or Holy Spirit or Holy Breath. In other words, just draw from the mind of Christ. Draw from your true mind. Listen to the voice of spirit and you'll realize you don't need any of that. And one of the proofs in the Bible is he went to Mars Hill. And they were all intellectuals and he tried to minister to them intellectually with wise words and wise understanding. And he saw no converts whatsoever. So the next place he went was, I believe it was Corinth, and he said, this time I came wanting to know nothing but Jesus and him crucified among you. I don't want to hear about your problems. I don't want to hear about the intellect. I just want to teach you about Jesus and what he came to reveal to you and that he entered into the judgment of the Jewish system that said, we have a law. Yeah. He declares him to be, to be son, himself to be son of God and he must die. I want you to know that he died to stop the sacrificial system. And he died by absorbing all your mistaken identity into himself and destroyed it. Yeah, that's good. And he did it. That's good. 
Correct? Yes. <clears throat> so, really, what we want our God to fight is a no thing. And that's what you've got to see. Every one of us have got to see it's a no thing. And you've just got to take care of yourself and leave everybody else alone. It's real easy to come to a fellowship, and I know y'all don't do this, and think, man, I wish Billy Bob was here. <laughs> I wish my husband would hear this. I wish my wife would hear this. I've seen it. I've stood in crowds where I've taught, and I've seen people pointing at them. <laughs> no, you take it for yourself. Put the ox you know, if you're on a plane and it's crashing, put the oxygen on you first before you try to help somebody else. Lily, quit pointing. Shame on you. <laughs> so we have made we have made mountains we have made mountains you used to say out of molehills but out of no thing they're not any molehills now I'm not going to say that these symptoms we're feeling aren't real I mean it really upset me when that doctor told me that none of this was real well <laughs> get in my shoes and see I'm suffering in my body I'm not suffering up here though and my, my awareness, but, but we've made mountains because we believe that, God, this is really a big one. And it's only going to take you. I need you to act today. And again, I say, Father, act from the foundation of the world. He put everything in us that pertains to physical life and spiritual life, and we have it already. This earth has everything that we'll ever need. So we expected Father to fight those no things for us. Really, I think sometimes if you could hear Father, he'd say, I don't know what you're talking about. I know he understands our hurtings and suffering, but that's right, vain imaginations. So really what we need is Father through comforter teachers and through the voice of spirit or the voice of the breath of God in us to instruct us. We do need understanding. I've had somebody tell me a long time ago, I don't need more teaching. Oh, yeah, you do. You're, you're gonna, you, you need to learn your whole life on this earth, yes. you know, and then become a teacher yourself or become whatever. I would think about this this morning. I'm not your example. I'm not your example. And Kay's not your example. Brother Garner wasn't our example. I remember Brother, Brother Garner was teaching a tremendous truth that he had at the time. And there were many people when he died, they will say, well, why did he die? Didn't he believe what he taught? you know, or whatever. And a lot of people just went back to the law. Quite a few of them did. Well, I was thinking about this this morning. You know, my son went to school to be an engineer and he's a fabulous engineer. He knows how to tell you how much weight a plane can take in certain parts. He knows to, uh, how, how to tell the stress and how he's very intelligent and he makes a lot of money, a really big amount of money. And I'm proud of him, but his teachers didn't make that much money. And his teachers didn't do what he did, right? Just because we teach something, I'm not saying I'm, I don't know how I want to word this. I'm just saying I'm not your example. I'm your teacher. I know it's true. Like those teachers at OU, they knew some truths, but they didn't want to be an engineer. They wanted to be a teacher. Now, I, I want to live out of all this, but I'm just saying, don't look at me to see if it's true. See if the Word says it's true. Yeah, yeah. I don't teach it to make it true. I'm teaching it because I know it's true. And I know if I continue to feed on the right thing, then that same spirit that was in Jesus, that same mind that was in Jesus, is going to cause me to make a withdrawal on the, the divine health within inside of me and drive all this out of me. I'm expecting it to leave. And for you too, whatever it is in you, I'm expecting it to leave. But we must embrace it, Thank right? You, yes. So it is that simple. Just practice breathing in the revelation and practice breathing it out. Guard, like John Cahill said, guard what you hear, guard what you say, guard what you see, and guard what you sense. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, it's something we can practice we can pay attention to what we're saying all day long and stop ourselves and be si qui quiet. And I say this very much, and Donna would say, Roy, you need to practice this more yourself. Before I open my mouth, I need to think, is this edifying? Does this line up with who we are? Does this line up with the Word of God? Before I open my mouth about somebody else, 
I need to shut my mouth mm -hmm. and think, is this edifying? Amen. Am I speaking the truth about who that person is? Because I could come to Ann and say, Carl, I mean, Ann, I need to tell you something about Carl. I've been seeing him at Brahms a lot. <laughs> and quite often I'll be talking to him and I see chocolate all around his <laughs> lips. And he tells me he hasn't been eating ice cream. And so I disdain Carl in your presence, right? It reminds me of a little grandson. I'm going to chase a rabbit here, but my little grandson was out there with me working on my boat. And he likes to get in the refrigerator out in the garage. He knows there's popcorn, but he just couldn't find anything that he wanted. And so he took a drink of orange juice. I saw him do it. And I said, okay, put it up. Well, the door was still open and he was real quiet. And I walked in and there was white powder all around his lips. And I thought, what in the world? And I looked down there and we have baking soda in there to, to absorb all those odors. And I said, did you taste that baking soda? He said, no. <laughs> I said, Ethan, it's all over your lips. I said, did it taste good? And he said, yes. <laughs> See, I just disdained my grandson right there. <laughs> Not in front of him. But it, isn't this true? And, and I know it, it makes us feel good. And we're, we're going to walk out of here and say, man, this was good today. But it's only good if you put it to practice. It's only good if you identify with it and say, this is who I am. It's only good if you show up every Sunday without fail. Thank you, Barbara. Barbara, Barbara just said amen. So mountains, mountains are high places of understanding. That's what mountains are. That, the only mountain that you have is a mountain that God's calling you up. He's saying, come up hither. What is the wilderness? A wilderness is a place of been alone. When Jesus went off into the wilderness and Luke 4, all he did is went up on the top of the temple and got away from the crowd so he can settle two questions. Am I who God says I am? Am I here to take over? Or am, am I here to enter into the judgment of the Jews? That's all he did. So any place you see wilderness, it's a place that's been alone. The children of Israel were taken out of Egypt where they were, they were slaves. They were slave-minded. And God brought them out. And it was only supposed to be for three days and three nights. But they wouldn't listen. They wouldn't follow. They were always believing the lie. And they wanted to go back and eat what they thought they had. And they never had any of that food ever. So it's a place of being alone with Father. So a mountaintop experience is a place of learning. And it's a place to receive true living instructions. Just like when God called Abraham up to the mountain. He said, and when I translated it out, uh, Abraham is the one that said, God told me to sacrifice my son. God never said that. He, t he said, bring your son up to the mountain and I'll tell you which mountain to ascend to. That's what it said. And all he wanted to do was let him know, I'm a loving father. I don't want your sacrifices. You do not need to sacrifice to any kind of God whatsoever. But he tried it again and the angel of the Lord stopped him, right? And I believe that was a Christophany, possibly of Jesus, stopped him. And then he said, God will provide himself a, a, a lamb or the lamb. And most people think that that ram was what God provided, but it wasn't. Abraham still went and found a ram and sacrificed because he still didn't listen. He didn't obey. And what does the word obey mean? Anybody remember? And guys, you should know this. It means to listen with obedience, or excuse me, with intelligence, and to be able to repeat that which was said. If you're not listening to me today with intelligence, I know you knew it, if you're not listening with intelligence, then when you go out in the world and somebody needs to make a withdrawal, you're not going to, be able to repeat what you heard, that's right? True. So you listen with intelligence. So that's what happened. And, and God provided, you know, you guys want sacrifices. You won't listen to me. I'm going to send my master teacher, Jesus, and he's going to enter into that judgment. And you know what? There was never another sacrifice made by the Jews after that. And nobody can tell you why. Nobody. It just stopped right then. <clears throat> so when we, we are free from what we think we need to resist or any form of retaliation, right? Or the idea that we want God to retaliate for us, then we can have a mature spine to go forth and be who we were born to be. Not until then can a person function in their authority, can a person function in their dominion over this earth or over their planet or over their earth. Because as long as you believe that God is in control of your life, and there's nothing you can do about it, 
then you're just going to live weak and sick and you're going to die needlessly. The Apostle Paul said, because people don't know who they are, he said, and the word many means all, all are weak, all are sick, and all die needlessly because they do not dissect the body. It didn't say the Lord's body. They added the word Lord's. That's 9999 there. He said, because you don't die, you don't, when you're dissecting, you're looking inside. When you don't realize who you are, you're, you're going to live a life of weakness and sickness and death. Mm-hmm. And death with God is just no knowledge of him. But yes, it ends up in physical death. So we want to be breath-minded, spirit-minded. They, they, you want to know how to stand still at all, the, all that pres- presents itself as a power. And don't be moved. Don't be shaken. So in closing... With a spirit of a mountaineer, mountaineer I mean, a mountaineer, right? What's a mountaineer? That's somebody that climbs the mountains. With a spirit of a mountaineer, mountains are not obstacles. They are high peaks of revelation. They bring us higher and higher in living as the breath of God. And so with a master essence, you are invincible. When you know who you are, see, if you're omnipotent, if you're all omnipresent and you're, and you're omnipowerful, that's not what the word says. But when, if you are those things, then you know who you are and you stand firm. If I'm the strongest physical man in the world, is there any other man that I'm afraid of? No. no, there's not. So we must always make ourselves available. We must always be ready at any time to bless others. That's what we're here on the earth for. With what we know and with our ability to bring help, it's not enough just to be a son of God. We need to, what we need is to be son of God with power. With power. We need to release that. We have an inward mantle and we're equipped with that power. Mm-hmm. Keep your position, stand still, knowing our Father takes us way beyond the commotion and the clamor of mortal minded men. Way beyond that. It's the stillness of oneness. And literally that stillness will keep your soul intact because we are so. I found these lyrics and I changed them. And I'm going to read these to you and then we'll stop. Be still and know that I exist in you. You want me to sing it? (laughs) No, you don't. (laughs) Donna's going, no, no. Be still and know that I exist in you. Be still and know that I exist is here. Be still and know that I exist, because that's what I am that I am. It means I exist that I exist. Be still and know that I exist is one with you. Be still and be still and know. When what seems to be darkness appears to you and colors you with fear and shame, be still and know that I exist in you. And I will remind you of our oneness. If a false sense of terror falls upon your bed and sleep no longer comes, remember all the words I've said, be still and know. Isn't that good? So happy and fortunate well-off are the ones who have unified their intention, their attention, and expression and divine solitude, for they shall live in bless, uh, excuse, live in bliss at the dwelling of the, uh, the breath of Father in eternity and light. They are at rest. That's what I pinned there at the last. So let me read it again. I stumbled on it. Yeah. You've had enough. Who said yes? Okay, one more time. Happy and fortunate and well-off are the ones who have unified their intention, attention, and expression in divine solitude, where they shall live in bliss as the dwelling of the breath of the Father in eternity and light. They are at rest. And in the book of Hebrews, God said, as I live, there will be a people that will enter into my rest. Amen. Amen. Hope you enjoyed this. Bless you. Amen. Thank you. Guys on Facebook, thanks for being here. We love you all.